welcome folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. We're gonna be picking up where we left off last Friday, which is on uh, with DOC and our CRF, the Corona Relief Fund. And um, we had some discussions back then of some of the appropriations. And I know that Becky has worked up a little bit of language um, it was to transfer dollars between some of the items. And um, also there's concern from DOC that was raised for the scanners and Wi-Fi and IT equipment. Um, not, we're not at the point of saying we need less money. Um, we just don't know how it's all gonna play out with the timing in terms of getting the equipment and then the delivery and being able to get the dollars out the door by December 30th. So the thinking was having sort of a check-in in October, November. Um, I've had some conversations with the speaker about this and um, she indicated to me that um, they're hearing this from other areas as well and that JFO, Steve Klein, is going to be working on some language uh, for a check-in before December 20th. So I don't know what the language is gonna say. Uh, so that's one piece. Uh, the other piece that we were looking at and Sarah Coffey did some work on this, which was the uh, 363,000 for the uh, CJCs and trying to figure out where that money is and if there's a log jam to get it out the door. So Sarah's been doing a lot of work on this the last couple of days. Um, do we want to start with the language first with Becky or, or do you want to hear from Sarah about the CJCs? Where do people want to go? Or does it not matter? Why don't we go with you, Sarah, for the C, C, CJCs and then we can figure out where we want the money to move between what projects. Okay, I think this could be can be relatively quick. Um, I, I, um, at the request of our chair, uh, I reached out to Jill Evans um, with the Community Justice Centers to understand what might be going on on their on their side of things um, with some of these dollars, and then. Um, Matt D'Agostino and I had a conversation this afternoon. And I think between, Matt, please chime in here anytime. Um, I think we figured out that it, it's not, it was more of a communication and perception problem about some of those dollars. So we, I think we got to the, some of the bottom of it is that some of the CJCs did, you know, are not as comfortable in understanding what these these dollars are for. And I think there's some room for clarification on that. And there's some flexibility, it sounds like with DOC to figure some of this out. And then there are some real dollars we heard from Matt on um, Friday around the 111,000 of that 363 that was for transitional housing. That That's a real, that's hard to get out the door. Um, and that might be something that we might wanna discuss but that the 252,000 um, that uh, for the CJCs for specifically, this is stuff for like, you know, cleaning supplies, PPE, uh, sneeze guards, um, laptops, things, you know, things so that they can do their work, outdoor plastic furniture so COSA groups can still meet. Um, and uh, there are 18 CJCs and, you know, different members have different understanding of how this could work. And I think they're all trying to be really careful with their budgets and their grants, and they don't want to do anything wrong. So um, Matt, we had a great conversation. And Matt, do you want to add anything? I think we figured out like that it might just be a communication issue with some of the CJCs and that um, some of them might be able to kind of come back to you with um, some more requests. But why don't you add anything that you'd like Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, for the record, Matt D'Agostino, Financial Director for Corrections. Um, we've I've since heard from from both Derek Mudovnik and, and an email that that uh, Jill Evans had sent him. I think there was a little bit of confusion from the CJCs in terms of what they 
can and can't do. And, and, you know, I could take the blame for that. You know, we were moving very quickly with the, quickly with this, and this is kind of uncharted territory for all of us. And I think that the um, COVID relief fund questionnaires that were, that were communicated and just communication in general, we weren't necessarily all on the same page. Now that said, by no means is anyone um, restricted in terms of what their requests are so far. We're very flexible in terms of the allocation of funds, the 252,000 of which about 140,000 of that has been requested by the vari by several of the CJCs. There are a couple that didn't request any funding at all. Um, and I do want to get to the bottom of that, why there, there wouldn't be expenses or, or what confusion there might be. So we have already set up a couple of um, conversations for starting tomorrow in terms of how we can better communicate this and or answer any questions that there might be outstanding from any of the individual CJCs or as a whole, because there are, I think, a lot of areas where funds were spent previously, and it wasn't CARES Act funding because none of us had CARES Act funding in March or April or knew that it was necessarily a guarantee that there would be any. Um, and I think that there's some, the comfort level with some of the CJCs might be that traditionally, when you've spent funds and then received federal funds, you can't just undo the purchases, the expenses you've already you've already incurred, um, because it leads to you know supplanting and and or you know thoughts that that that's generally prohibited activity. I think we need we need to kind of have a better a, a more in depth conversation maybe at the individual level with with the CJCs in terms of if there were expenses incurred, if they were COVID related that if they're from March, starting on March 1st, these are eligible expenditures. And I don't, I wanna make sure that we capture all of those because it is possible in the roughly 150,000 of the 363,000 total that's now been requested, it is possible that there's, there's at least some funds that haven't been requested simply because of a misunderstanding. And again, they're not, they're not locked out of this process. We've, we've submitted our request in terms of starting to grant and expend these funds, but that by no means, by no means does that mean that the 150 that's been requested is the cap. We know that we have access to the, the full amount should the CJCs need that full amount or something more than what's already been requested. So for Sarah and Matt, is there any uh, need for any language to be put in to the appropriations bill to make sure these dollars get out the door? Or do you feel confident enough that um, the communication avenues have been addressed? I went over to either one of you. I, I would. I might look at the language again, but my sense is that it was pretty clear um, when we did this with the original um, dollars. And I think it's. I think it's just about how we. You know, this is a complicated process uh -huh. and a new process. So I might look back at the language just to double check, but I think I looked at that. I mean, Mary Hooper also looked at the language. I think it's I think it's clear. As long as DOC has a clear understanding about what the legislative intent was, I think. Um, I, I believe so. Looking at it, it says that that two hundred fifty-two thousand specifically is uh, for direct costs incurred at the centers as a result of COVID nineteen. I think if we have the flexibility to communicate our, our interpretation of the intent, which is COVID related expenses. And so it says incurred, but I, I think incurred could be slightly confusing because some haven't incurred these costs yet. There, there's some in fact that I believe haven't had any COVID related costs because they didn't have funding for those costs. Prior to, prior to this language going in, they had no ability to spend funds because they, they didn't know they'd be reimbursed for those and didn't have them available. So there may be some confusion with the word incurred, but if we're, if we're, if we're able to read this intent as incurred, not as a previously incurred from the period, March 1st through December 30th, I think that, that we have, there's plenty of flexibility in the language to enable all of the expenses that, that have or will be um, expended to, to be approved if they're eligible. So questions from the committee for folks, what people are thinking. Kurt? Yeah, just for, for my um, edification, what is the communication path if something happens that we need to get 
something out to all 18 CJCs? Is there, is there a central person or how does that work? So, yes, um, there's, so there's, there's the grant managers for the, for the community justice center grants and, and Derek Mudovnik is our restorative justice director. And he heads, he heads the group that works with them. I think Derek and, and his staff are the ones largely that interact with the, the CJCs and, and any of the entities related to the CJC. So there is, there is a, a way of, and we've been on a couple of, or I've been on a Zoom call now. I know he's, he's done several of them, similar to how we're all doing these uh, in terms of communicating and, and reaching out to all of the, the Justice Center directors at one time. Okay. So this, this could be a very quick turnaround in terms of any, any additional communication we need to have and, and clarifying with them any, any concerns. Okay. Other questions, Butch? Oh, Matt or Sarah. So the uh, the I, I'm I'm getting the feeling or the thought or the whatever that the CJCs were scared to uh, because they didn't know how to or what it was eligible for or they just don't want to bother or all of the three. I could I could respond to that if Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yep. So because I spoke to, I reached out to a couple of CJCs and my local CJC was one of the ones that did not apply for the for the funding because for some of the reasons uh, books that you said, like, you know, kind of like they've they have to figure out their priorities and there's a lot happening right now. And so they they just were like, oh no, I'm I'm gonna do a fig our CJC had did some extra fundraising that wound up co covering some of these costs, but that that would have gone to something else. And so I think that there was um the perception by some of them that maybe the funding wouldn't be there, so they didn't want to spend the money. Um, so I think Matt and I figured out what where maybe some of the things might have gone astray, and that there, it sounds to me that between Matt and um, and um, Derek, that there's going to be another communication to let folks know. Um, and I and I I circled back with Jill Evans too to let her know a little bit about what was going on, um, because. I think the environment that we're all, we see this with our schools, you know, like our school janitors don't know that there's funding to pay for the, the special cleaning supplies that are needed all, you know, that's, it's, it, we're, I think it's similar here. And um, that's what I heard from the few C CJCs that I spoke to and from Jill. So I think, I think there were, I think there were two who didn't apply. One was from Brattleboro and the other one might've been from Rutland. That's right. So, so Butch, you might want to, I mean, the, I just well, we want to Mary. We got Mary from, well, you said Brattleboro, not Bennington. So Brattleboro and Rutland. So we got, so if you look in the chat, Becky just sent us all a chat that incurred in the language that's in the act. Incurred is costs incurred between March 1st and December 30th. So it's pretty clear. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that that the section that appropriates to DOC is part of the greater coronavirus relief fund section, and and there are some administrative provisions that are tied to that, um, and and it clarifies the time period. So thank you for that, Becky. That will help DOC uh, with knowing what incurred means, uh, Marsha. What it might be wise then to just check in with our local CJC and ask them. It might be. That might be the path and not worry about any language is what I'm thinking too. Does that make yeah. sense to the committee? Does that make sense yeah. to you, Sarah and Matt? That we just check in with our local CJCs and Sure, and, and, and I think that makes a lot of sense to be proactive about it. And um, it sounds to me also that Jill Evans is, is kind of a liaison between all the CJCs mm -hmm. and DOC. And um, I circled back with her. And I just wanna say there was, there was a form that, that, that people got and Matt and I agreed that we could understand how it would be confusing because um, it looked as if like if you're starting a new program compared to expenses that um, need to be reimbursed. So I think, you know, we're all moving fast here. So yes, we it are. sounds like we have a good solution. Butch? So even though 
many of us are going to check with our local CJCs. Would it be wise to, and I think Matt, you said you were going to do it anyway, just to reiterate and restate the uh, uh, conditions and eligibility requirements to every CJC, either in an email or a, so, some, some form of communications through Jill or, or, or somebody officially so that we double check and triple check. So we want to make sure they're taken care of. I, I agree with that because I think you need to have that that connection with DOC so that it's directly in case one of us missed being in contact with our head of our C, um, our community justice centers. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing and seeing support of that as the path forward and not any language. Makes sense? Okay, that one's easy. Um, so let's transition to Becky with the language that she has worked up and Phil, maybe you could post it or put it on the screen. Um, we talked about moving money around and where we were thinking is not moving money from the C C J C J C S. We wanted to move money between um, the 327 that would be going, was it there? No, that one was for the network. Um, no, it wasn't there. We were gonna keep money there. Um, it was the 760,000 for the scanners temperature scanners and the 700,000 with the Wi-Fi and heat mapping. We were thinking of allowing money to be moved between those two projects, those two items. Then it was the 350,000 that there for domestic violence and direct rentals. And there was thinking that um, not all of the direct rentals would be out the door and the, the balance could go to the domestic violence program. So there were two different places that we were looking at to move money around. So Becky, I know was participating and listening in, but she was also working on other things at the same time. So some might've gotten lost in the translation or not. So I'm gonna turn it over to Becky and walk us through the language and we may have to um, change this a little bit. And also Becky, if you know anything of what's going on with joint fiscal with Steve Klein and looking at um, a check-in, like maybe in October or November. Yeah, I, um, I do know that there's um, language that's gonna be worked on sort of generally for all um, CRF money that's unexpended um, and a check-in and uh, it's uh, I, I'm working on it too so it's not done yet <laughs> but it is being worked on. Um, so Becky is that going to be with joint fiscal committee or is it going to be with the emergency board or who? On um, it's not really finalized all yet but I think there will be a legislative um, a sort of approval process involved in, in how to prioritize any unexpended funds. Okay, great. So why don't you walk us through this? Sure, so um, I just wanted to point out um, in the first paragraph here, this is from Act 120, the, the quarter one budget. And I just, um, we're just looking at the amount, the 2.5 million that was appropriated to DOC from coronavirus relief funds. And so there is already some language in here that I wanted to point out to the committee that um, starting on line six, it says that these funds are, are allocated below. Allocations that cannot be used by December 30th may be reallocated to other eligible COVID-19 cost categories. And if um, there is a reallocation that would be uh, reported to uh, mm -hmm. Justice Oversight, Finance and Management, and the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, so there is some provision already that was baked into the Act 120 to allow for some reallocation authority for DOC. 
Um, so I just wanted to point that out because it's kind of general and I don't know if what you want to do right now is be more specific about um, how that money can be reallocated. So Becky, I'm going to interrupt you there. Would that then allow DOC lines six through eight, would that then allow DOC to transfer money between the temperature scanner line item and the Wi-Fi and heat mapping and IT equipment? I think, I actually think that it does allow that. I think that it's, well, it allows it if it can't be used. So I don't know how that is um, interpreted by DOC. Is it, it can't be used because they didn't have enough funding to buy a body scanner or it can't be used because the product is not available yet. Like I, so I, I don't know. Um, it doesn't really define what the reason by can't be used is, um, but I think it it could it could perhaps be broad enough to to um, cover that situation. So, if anyone has any questions, I can only I, see a portion of you. I have a question. Okay, Kurt. Uh, regrettably, but um, line seven. I realize this is. I don't know if it's existing law, but it's not something we were planning to change. But line seven, um, the funds are allocated below comma. Shouldn't this, that be a this is current law? Well, okay, but it still still doesn't make sense. Should that be a period and a capital A for allocations? Um, it. Could be uh, this is not something that I think, um, uh, I think this was part of the, the JFO budget bill drafting process. So I don't, I actually don't know if all of the um, sort of introductory paragraphs are like that. I can double check on that. And, um, but you're, you're right, it's not really a, a full sentence. Okay, <laughs> sorry. It's in the appropriations world. Yeah, but even the appropriations world has to use full sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Point. Yeah. Other questions? Just speak up because I can't see all of you. You have a question. Does DOC feel that allocations that cannot be used by December 30th gives you that flexibility to move? particularly between those two items of scanners and the IT? Matt, Matt, I'll let you answer that. You, you know better than I. Madam Chair, I, I believe so. I, I believe, and I, we, I was aware of this language when we were speaking about this last week. I just wanted to be certain that if we, if we know that there's going to be a higher cost in one area or not the, expend, not the full expenditures of an allocation in another area, that, that this language actually did give us the, authority, the ability to, to do that because it, it's slightly restrictive. I don't think so restrictive to, to uh, Becky's point earlier that, that, that we can't do it, but it's, it's, not, it's not as clear as the language sometimes is regarding moving funds from one area to another. I just wanted to be certain because it is federal funding, because it was allocated specifically for these particular purposes, that if we knowingly you know, have less expenses in one category and move it to another, that there won't be an issue with that. I, Again, reading it, it doesn't seem like there would be, but we just want to be certain before we do that. And of course, there's, there is the, um, um, the need to speak with joint, the Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, Finance and Management, Joint Fiscal. So it's not like we'd be doing this without anyone knowing about it. And of course, there's going to be a conversation if that happens. But I, I believe the language allows us to do this and when we'd be able to work within the confines of this. Okay. Anything else from the committee before we continue down? Well, Alice, yeah, I'm, Butch. I'm just wondering, uh, we do this, this in the capital, something similar to this in the capital bill too, in, in section, typically in section two, we outright say that uh, the commissioner can move money around and he has to notify the chairs of the committee. And I'm just wondering if the language is proposed here is, is a good backup language so that uh, there's no question when the money moves and uh, just people get notified. Uh, or if it's redundant, it's redundant, but sometimes redundancy is the best thing to have. Well, if you look at the justice oversight, you've got, I'm on the committee, 
you're on the committee. Um, Senator Sears, who's part of the Appropriations Committee on the Senate side. I'm trying to think who else. You got uh, Senator Hooker, Senator Lyons. Mary Hooker. Mary, yeah, you have Mary. So you've got the bases covered on justice oversight. Other questions, comments? Speak up, I can't see you all. So Becky, why don't you bring us down to the rest? You've got the 760 for the scanners, 700 for the IT, and then you added some language there at the end of um, the IT section. Yeah, sure. So um, on lines 19 to 21, um, what I, and I, I may have misheard the, the discussion, but what I thought was being discussed was moving um, any unexpended IT money to the, the temperature scanner and body scanner line item. So the language here says that any funds not expended for the purpose in this subdivision for the, the technology upgrades may be used for the purpose described in 10A, which is the body scanner and temperature scanner. So I, I don't know if um, you wanted greater flexibility than that to allow body scanner, temperature scanner funds to be used for technology upgrades. If that's the case, then I would have to um, perhaps put the same language in, in the line item above in, a, in subdivision A. Um, if you want to be more specific than what is in that introductory paragraph. So I'm wondering if we're in conflict with the language. Um, Phil, if you can scroll it so we can see that introductory paragraph. If we're in conflict with that, because allocations that cannot be used, so we're talking all the allocations are in this section. So it's more than just A and B. It also deals with the 350,000 for rentals and domestic violence, as well as the CJCs. So in the opening paragraph, it appears as if we, within all of those, A, B, C, and D, you can move money around. And then when you go down to A and B, you're limiting. And I think what we were thinking, between A and B, you could move money just between those two. A and B. So if temperature scanners came in higher and technology came in lower, you could move the money up to temperature temperature scanners and vice versa. Is that in conflict with that opening paragraph where it's saying you can do it through with all of those that are listed below? Um I think it's sort of being more specific. I think that in the the introductory paragraph is pretty broad, um, but I do think that if you want to prioritize how you want the money to move, then um, I would suggest uh, maybe taking it out of A and B specifically and moving the language up to the, you know, to add it to six through through eight to um, just clarify maybe a priority of, you know, you know, first priority would be to move between A and B. Um, if you want to be that specific, I, I just, I don't know how sort of prescriptive the committee wants to be with the ability to move money around. There is a, there is a big difference here though, because in the first paragraph, it says that cannot be used by December 30th. And the other paragraphs that we're talking about just say uh, not expand, expended at any time. So the first paragraph has to wait till December 20th, 30th before it can reallocate, doesn't it? Um, no, I think uh, what that is saying is if, if DOC determines that they're not able to, to allocate it by December 30th. So I, see. I, I mean, I don't know. I, this might be a question for Matt, but like, for example, there might be something that you know by October 15th that you're not going to be able to use the money for by December 30th. And I think that language in six through eight um, would cover that scenario. I see. 
<clears throat> yeah, that's reasonable. And I, I think I might have been on mute before when I was talking <laughs> um, about the conflict. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I have uh, a child who is not in school right now, so I'm trying to be on mute as much as possible. Um, <laughs> It's so fine. we can hear, <laughs> we hear your child that's fine is that Lola? <laughs> yes yes um yeah <laughs> it's fine so um what i was saying is that i i think that there's perhaps a conflict in that the language and the introductory paragraph is is pretty broad and then you're creating this sort of priority with a and b so it could create some um it could just be like an uncertain decision for D DOC about how they, how they, what the intent of the legislature was. So I think if, you know, I think first you just have to decide if you want to be that specific. And if so, I would probably recommend um, taking that language that I had added in on line 19 and just um, maybe creating a Sort of a priority list in the introductory paragraph about how DOC might think about moving the money around um, to just show what the, the intent of the legislature is. Um, because I do think if they have some unexpended money and then there's those these two um, sets of language that they might not know what the committee's preference was. Right. It's in, yeah. I mean, that's what I was thinking. DOC wouldn't, wouldn't know which way to go because it seems like they're mm -hmm. not um, in tangent, not together. Why don't we scroll down because we've got temperature scanners, we got the IT upgrade, and then we have the three for the justice centers, and then we have the 350 for the rental housing and um, and what's the other in the domestic violence. So when we were talking last Friday, we were okay with the 350 with the rental housing and the domestic violence to be um, reallocated or to be used between those two where DOC could move money between those two. We were okay with A and B moving within those two. We wanted to keep C with the justice centers uh, protected. We didn't want those dollars to be tapped for A, B, or D. Is, are we still thinking that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Other folks? I'm, so, I'm thinking that if, it, rather than have the money, <laughs> If the money can't be used for the CJCs, then I think it should be able to be used at any other DOC purpose listed here, as opposed to returned uh, on December 20th. I mean, if we can use it in, for the scanners, we might as well. Sarah? I think the, the, the challenge with that is that I think the scanners need to be ordered earlier than that. And I do, th I, 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 I feel pretty strongly about wanting to protect that money for the CJCs because I think we received information that they really can use it. So, um, and that the, it might be about clarifying in the language as our chair was, was saying that might be about the, and, and Becky about prioritizing um, uh, things. Cause I agree, we don't want to leave any money on the table, um, but we want to make sure that the decision about how it gets taken off the table is in a, you know, in a priority order. Cause I, I, I think those scanners will need to be ordered soon. Um, and what we heard on Friday was that some of the IT upgrades we already know are not gonna be possible. So that's, I think where I heard at least all of the committee members saying that there was, that made a lot of sense to give that flexibility now. Um, and so maybe there's a better way to, to Maybe maybe it's about pulling that out and putting it up top. I don't, I don't know. Becky might know. Other folks? I think the fear was that we had on Friday because we're so uncertain with the C CJCs, we didn't want that money pulled to go towards the other items. That's yeah. what we, we were concerned about. And I think that concern is still there 
Um, huh, yeah. And I don't know, how would we list our priorities? I mean, our priorities are A, B, C, and D. Um, in D, we're saying that um, you can move money among, uh, between domestic violence and rental housing within that 350000 only. And then we're also saying in A and B, because it's more equipment that we're purchasing <clears throat> and IT equipment, keep those two together and move money between those two. Is that where we still are as a committee? Alice, uh, it's Carl here. I, yep. I, um, so I just on the scanners, they have some real benefits to the facilities beyond the whole pandemic piece. Mm -hmm. To the degree that, you know, I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to get all the ones that we want or if we'll be able to spend all that money, but, um, I think to the degree that we can get them, we should do that because there's some cost savings there for the department um, down the road in terms of uh, staffing and, or not so much staffing, but it frees up staff to do other things. Um, but at the same time, I really think that all the money that the CJCs are eligible for, they should get. So I'm not sure how to, how to parse that out and all this, but that's, that's sort of where I am with this. Mm -hmm. Other folks? Is it too cumbersome to have a have a, something saying that they need to, before they move anything from the CJCs, they need to check with us or check with you or something? I could do that. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, do you why, have any why would, why would we I'm move not... money from the CJCs? I mean, give us a chance to touch base with them and see if they're using it. Right. Becky. And so, so if it, if DOC touches base with them and it finds out that it can't be used, there is, and they want to reallocate it, the provision in the first paragraph says that there is that notification um, to Justice Oversight, um, Finance and Management, and JFO. So maybe the key to dealing with this is approaching it backwards in that the introductory paragraph does allow for movement between A and B and C and D, between all of those. They can move between A, B, C, and D, however they, well, not however they wish, but if there's no, I can't see the first paragraph, but no cost incurred. What we wanna do is carve out the CJCs from that sentence on line six through eight. That's really what we're doing. And we wanna hold the CJC money aside from being um, allocated, reallocated to the other items below, to the scanners, to the Wi-Fi, IT, to domestic violence, to um, rental assistance. We're saying for all those other items, you can move the money around, but for the C CJCs, that's held harmless and we're not taking money from there. That's what I'm hearing the committee say. Well, that does assume that the, I mean, they have 140K that's already uh, allocated and there's 252K for altogether. Right. So, so that's, that's assuming there's another 112K that they'll be able to come up with. Mm-hmm. No, Sarah. Well, I, I think Matt can probably answer that question more clearly. I think it's 252 to the CJCs, and then within that, this the CJCs also work on with transitional housing programs. So there was 111 thousand dollars. Yeah, but that's on top of that's and that that brings it up to 363. Well, Kurt is saying there's 252 for direct programming to CJCs and 140 has already been requested. So that leaves you 112,000 that has not been requested. I see, um, yeah. And if you divide that by 18 CJCs, that's 62, a little over 62,000. 
Which one, the 252? Uh, the remaining 112. 112. Oh, brother. Like I said, I think we should touch base with them and see if the ones that haven't applied and see why, and maybe we can help them out. So if I may, um, yes, related to the language, you know, we're commissioner and I are hearing loud and clear um, related to uh, C, the 363,000, that there wouldn't be the same flexibility in that particular item, um, given that the, the introductory paragraph requires that we get approval from joint justice oversight and others. I, I don't, I don't know if the language needs to be tweaked in any way where we our, our hope is that we can work with the community justice centers to at least on the $252,000 piece fund them more fully from that from that allocation the 111,000 for transitional housing could be a little bit more challenging and that's a couple of reasons there's of the 18 I believe there's four justice centers that have transitional housing attachments and because this funding is limited, I think that that because it's only through December 30th, they don't have the same ability that they would if this were a longer term. For instance, you know, if they wanted to get an additional apartment or building or something, they're not they wouldn't be able to sign a lease knowing that this is one time funding that that ends in December. So I think that the request that we've seen from there, the, the roughly 13,000 of that, while I suspect we might be able to help them increase that request it's very unlikely that we would get to the full 111,000 given the, the restrictions on those expenditures. But again, related to the language, if our understanding is, is that this is money that stays in that allocation and doesn't get moved to the other subsections, the, the first, the introductory paragraph does that as long as we're understanding at DOC that we're not going to request it through Joint Justice Oversight, Finance and Management, Joint Fiscal Office. Well, you know, if you really look at this language in the opening paragraph, it isn't that the Justice Oversight and Finance Management and JFO needs to approve it. It's just that you report it. There's no approval process. So maybe with the three, 363,000, there needs to be an approval process and maybe just do the approval process through the Justice Oversight Committee before any money is reallocated. Alice, can I ask Matt a question? Mm -hmm. hey, Matt, I just emailed Susan Cherry, who's head of the CJC in St. Johnsbury. And she said that they, she hasn't seen anything from her request yet. That's How long does so, it usually take? Well, we, the, so the, the grant, the grants with the community, with the community justice centers need to be amended to include these federal dollars. Um, before we're able to do that, we have to get approval of the spending authority, and that's that's through the, the CRF questionnaires that are being approved, and reviewed, and approved by agency of administration. Once that's completed, we can actually issue the grants to them. Um, perhaps one of the failures here is that there, there's no new news for them, but we should communicate to them that. We've re we know they know we've received their requests. I don't think there's been communication, good enough conversation or, or communication to let them know that we haven't received news for an update. There, there's this is still being worked on. Their requests, effectively, what they've requested is what we've requested to fund them with, um, but we haven't received an approval of that quite yet. So the, the, it's not it's not that there's no news because we we because these requests aren't going anywhere. It's, there's no news because we don't have the ability to grant those funds yet, but the intent is to grant everything they've requested. When we worked with them at the early stages on their requests, so far there's not something that's been requested that DOC isn't supportive of. Thank it's you. Just a of getting through the, the, the processes to, to fund them for this, these items. Okay. So oh, Becky, were you going to weigh in or not? Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, think through carving out the CJCs and getting approval um, and just how that timing would work with the fact that the money has to be spent by the end of the year 
um, and also just with the language that I know is being worked on, which is going to allow. Um, so I think I think department and agencies that have not spent their money like beginning in October are going to have to report if that money was not spent. Um, so there might be sort of like a greater force in the background that is going to be just deciding what to do with that money. Um, so in some ways, I almost it almost seems like I'm, I guess a concern I would have is that if you carve out that you can't reallocate any of those funds, and then for some reason they're not um, used in October, and then DOC has to report that, um, does that somehow put at risk those funds generally than from being able to be perhaps reallocated to one of the other cost categories here. Um, I, I, I don't really know the answer. I'm just trying to th think through that, but I just wouldn't want that to be the result by somehow um, saying like you can't touch that particular line item. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Just to follow up on what Becky was saying, I think a lot of this is a very tight timeline um, from what I understand from how it's working with the agency of the administration and DOC and these grants. And so I would have a little bit of concern about making another hoop that then leaves $111,000 or something on the table that can't be used. I mean, is it worth having a conversation about the transitional housing dollars that DOC is fairly confident cannot get out the door, like the, of that 363. Um. So it feels like we've gone complete circle to um, go back to where we were, not with Becky doing any additional drafting, what she presented to us, just go back to what's in the current act and not change anything. I mean, that's where I'm sort of, it feels like we've gone full circle going back to um, the original language and not looking at anything that Becky has drafted to this point. Funds are gonna be allocated below and allocations that cannot be used by the 30th may be reallocated to other eligible COVID cost categories. And any of those reallocations would be reported to the Oversight Committee, Commissioner of Finance and Management, and Joint Fiscal Office. So the way the language is currently in law doesn't cover what we want. Alice? Butch. Thanks. Uh, so we have to have, as a committee, have to have some degree of trust with the uh, uh, current commissioner and his team uh, as, as they're operating today. Now, we know, or I think I know, that his desire to strengthen our CJCs and transitional housing is, is pretty strong. Uh, I would, and what I've heard from Matt today, I think they'll make every effort to expend uh, all the money they can in, in those areas in a judicious manner. So I, I have that kind of trust in the commissioner and, and if he doesn't do it, he can talk to justice oversight and we'll put him in the hot seat. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with, with the current language uh, in uh, line six to eight and, and just kind of leave it alone and let them manage this money because of the short timelines involved. Other folks? Sarah, are you nodding yes or? Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, yeah. I would agree with that too. I think the most important thing is to get the money spent. Yeah. I agree too. It's fun to spend money. <laughs> right. So we've come full circle to keep the current language and law the way it is and not do any new drafting. I'd still change the comma to a period. But <laughs> <laughs> I think you gotta let that one go, Kurt. Oh, well. 
Hey, Matt, could you let us know when you do get the ability to send the grant dollars out? Absolutely, we'll do. Our, our hope is our hope is that in the in the next couple of days or sometime next week we'll we'll ha we'll have the we'll have that that answer and and be able to we'll communicate out prior to this of course and then let let everyone know where where it is in the process but the hope is by sometime by next week that we would have the ability to start moving these funds and and grant uh, change amending the grants to include the the requested dollars before we do that of course we want to make sure that we're not excluding any amounts that perhaps were left off the original request. So there, there, there's a couple of steps we need to take here, but we will definitely keep the CJCs as well as you all apprised of where we're at. Thank you. And eyes will be looking. Many eyes are gonna be looking in. <laughs> Sarah? I just wanna express my appreciation to Matt, um, who's been really responsive and, and I appreciate you helping our community justice centers, you know, figure out how to use this these these federal dollars i really appreciate um the work you're doing thank you thank you okay so that completes our work for today on this particular piece there's another issue i want to bring up for how we our work for coming up on thursday which is a little different than madam that. chair before you move today i just want to i just want to say i appreciate representative shaw and his comments and you know, you all know, I've said this many times, the justice centers have my personal commitment and corrections commitment. Um, they are going to be, and they are a vital piece of what community corrections is gonna look like five years from now. Mm -hmm. And we need to invest every penny we can in them. And um, so you have my word that, you know, for some reason we run into problems, we're gonna come back to you. We're not moving money. <clears throat> That money was, that money was, uh, you know, a box was put around that money for the purposes of supporting them. So, appreciate that. Great, right. Representative Thanks. Coffey, you, you you now know why I was so happy that Matt came back to work for corrections. <laughs> you now know why I was so happy. I do. All right, right. <laughs> He's an asset. That's both of you are. So, so we don't have any recommendations to give to appropriations on any of the CRF dollars. The only recommendation was you really need to have a check-in sometime in October or November, and that's being worked on by Joint Fiscal Office. So, so that ties up all of our work on our budgets. Um, and we did good work and that should be behind us. Did we send an official letter on the BGS to Everything was unofficial. When Peter Fagan was here, we sent him off. And then when Mary was here, we sent her off last Friday on the DOC budget. And then we started working on the CRF for that. So for our work going forward, um, I was um, reached out to and, and sort of had my statement as well. There's work happening within two of our committees, House Judiciary and House Government Operations Committee on um, racial equity and, and social justice work and racial justice work. A lot of terms are used sort of interchangeably. Um, as you know, when we were in session at the end of June, there was legislation passed about use of force uh, for law enforcement and um, there is thinking that we've just been looking at law enforcement in terms of racial justice or the whole social equity. And corrections is really an important piece. And I think that was brought up, particularly with a situation that occurred with uh, Kenneth Johnson. Um, I think it's also coming into play with what occurred um, within the Chittenden Correctional Facility uh, over the years, not just the Chittenden facility, but across the system with a sexualized work environment. Um, there's lots of issues happening with uh, inmates with mental health issues and how people can, people in power or people with control over folks have some implicit bias in a number of arenas. So it, 
it was requested that we take a look at this uh, within the corrections world. And I stepped up to the plate and said, yes, we, this committee should take a look at this. This is our jurisdiction. We understand corrections. Um, it's not getting into a deep dive because we just don't have the time to do this because we're only going to be in session a few more weeks. Um, but it's to lay the groundwork for how we proceed in January and maybe come up with some simple language of maybe doing a report, a report back to us in terms of how uh, the training should um, possibly look look like to encompass uh, racial justice um, or social equity, however you want to phrase it. I had a conversation with the commissioner um, today, earlier today about this and um, commissioner, if I can just quickly just turn it over to you and what your thoughts are a little bit on this. And from there, we can possibly see if we can set up some testimony uh, to begin our work come Thursday morning with some folks. And one thing I did ask the commissioner is if we did something like this, who, who would DOC want to be working with um, as a whole piece here? So I'm going to turn it over to you, Commissioner. And yeah, Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, let me start out by saying that um, if, if, you are, if you are anywhere in a leadership role in any place in the criminal justice system, and you're not paying attention to this issue of equity, then um, you're, 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 um, you're not paying attention. I mean, all we have to do is look at what's happening across the country. And, um, you know, I, I think historically for correctional institutions and correctional departments, and I don't mean this specifically to Vermont, I'm talking about systems in general, they've kind of looked at it as, well, you know, we just supervise the folks that the courts send us or whatever the case may be. Um, but there's plenty of places in the correctional system where bias can sneak into decision making. And uh, Madam Chair is right. Um, when you have power and control over people's lives, it's important that you step back and do a self evaluation of how you use that power and control. You know, I, I sent a message out to the entire department on a video um, after the George Floyd case in Minnesota. And I talked about that power differential that we, be, we possess and that we have to pay attention to how we use that. And it isn't just about, it is not just about um, individuals of color, you know, black skin, brown skin folks. It's, um, it's around gender, it's around sexual preference, it's around religious beliefs, it's around a whole host of things that um, I, I think the time is right for Vermont Department of Corrections to step up and be a leader. Now, as I explained to, to, to the chair prior in our conversation today, we're, we're starting to do a lot of that work. In fact, just before I, I got on here, I was on an hour and a half briefing that our leads on our hiring process gave to um, the DHR to include the commissioner about what we're doing to change the hiring process. And we've already, we've already engaged Tabitha Moore from Rutland and NAACP to advise us as we develop the hiring process, where can bias sneak into the system? And this goes to your point, uh, Madam Chair, about training. And, <clears throat> and there was a, I'll say to the chair when we talked at noontime today, <clears throat> there was an incident I was just briefed about um, this morning by staff around an incident where um, a mom had called about conditions and uh, uh, her son in jail and um, he happens to be someone of color and um, our reaction to that followed the protocol no doubt about it but the protocol ended up with a bad outcome and so it's kind of you know it's one thing to, to hide behind we follow protocol it's another thing to step back and go did we have to follow that protocol? And did we follow that protocol because this person was a person of color? And that's a very hard conversation to have. So I'm, I'm all for getting into this conversation. Um, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, Madam Chair, I, I, I'm a little hesitant to 
we get into too heavy lifting right now. Um, before January, um, 338 is, is uh, pretty heavy lifting for us right now. We pretty much got two staff members. That's all they're doing um, five days a week is work on the implementation of 338 with CSG. But I would like to have this conversation and start the conversation and maybe come back with some recommendations in January. And I, and I mentioned this to you, Madam Chair. I think um, I would like to come in in January with recommendations about a legislative package that deals with some of the challenges that I think Corrections has. And I really think that um, our position in the system is not much different than the position of a police officer in the system. We, we wield a lot of authority. Um, we, have, we have a lot of control over people's lives, especially when they're incarcerated. But we also have a lot of control over people's lives in the community too. And so I think, um, I'll say it again, if you're in the justice system and you're not thinking about this, then you're not thinking. And I think that's, uh, that's an important conversation to start having with your committee. And I, I mean, I think we could come in and start talking about we're doing a lot of work in this space right now. And, and the first part of the work is uh, being willing to have the conversation because it's not easy. Um, if you're as old as I am and been around for a while, and I've had a lot of conversations about issues around race in my career, it's still uncomfortable to talk about it. It's uncomfortable. And uh, as I said to staff this morning in this situation that we chatted about, the only way that you're gonna start changing that culture and open up that dialogue is, it's not about being hard on employees, it's about having the conversation and having it so um, with some level of sophistication and education that you understand what this issue is about. Because a lot of folks react to it unsophisticated, uneducated. And I think that's the piece that we need to focus on inside corrections. So. And uh, the last piece I'll talk about is many times in these situations, you may have somebody that's a, a, a very tough situation to deal with. They've been in and out of the system for a while and kind of referencing the situation that I have briefed on this morning. Um, you know, folks are in and out of the system a lot. The system's hardened the hell out of them. And um, they're not easy to deal with. They're not easy for the corrections officers to deal with. But there is a level of procedural justice that we deserve to give to them. But also to change this conversation, our employees have to have a level of procedural justice too. It's not all about, okay, you violated that policy and we need to do something with you. It's more about having the conversation around equity in the system and making sure we're being fair and impartial to everybody we deal with. There is no way of becoming imperfect in this area. But I do think opening up this dialogue, and I had mentioned to the chair, and I had actually mentioned to Senator Sears at one point, as this conversation unfolds on the policing side of the issue, um, I think it should be more than just policing and criminal justice, by the way, because there's a lot of bias in other pieces of the system, just not police and just not corrections. But as this conversation unfolds, you would do a, a very big injustice to the system if you didn't include corrections at the time. I hope that, that conversation we had in the time. Yeah, I appreciate your take on all this. Thank you, Commissioner. And we do have a question, uh, Carl. Thank you, Commissioner. I uh, I, I appreciate uh, what you had to say. I, I like the idea of um, some sort of a, a legislative package and your thoughts on that um, next January. Um, Last January, when I think you first came and met us for the first time, along with Secretary Smith, uh, um, three words that we heard a lot of and the three words we've heard a lot of all, all along here have been hiring, uh, supervision, and training. In, in your mind, is that are those the three issues here? Is that what needs work, or is there something beyond that that also uh, you'd like to... As I, as I stated at this meeting I was at earlier, I think hiring is one of the big keys. I think hiring is one of the big keys. Supervision is one of the big keys too. And education um, around the issues of equity, fairness, and uh, impartiality in the system is, is, a, is a big piece. That'll go a long ways of changing the culture, Representative. I think you have to remember 
um, in the situation I described this morning, um, folks followed the protocol, but when I'm told about the protocol, it just didn't feel right. But that's how folks have been trained and educated to deal with someone who wasn't compliant, right? And they followed protocol and they didn't do anything wrong. But just because you didn't do anything wrong doesn't mean it was the right decision, if you know what I mean. So part of that is also this slow process of educating people. And I'm, and and I'm kind of adding on the education about open dialogue and having people who, are, who have been part of the system help you better understand what it's like to be in that system, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that completely makes sense. I, I, I get that. I, and I get that, you know, when you're talking about changing hiring and changing uh, training and changing supervision, you're talking about changing culture. That's yeah, it's a, and again, you know, I have to say this, and I, sometimes I forget to say it. Um, the folks in corrections right now are working under enormous pressure. And um, what they do every day is just amazing to me. Um, and I've been around the block a few times, as you all know. Um, so the majority of the employees we have are doing the right thing. Even when they do the right thing, we still have to evaluate on this issue of uh, equity. Just, I'll say it again, just because it's the right thing doesn't mean it's the right thing, if you know what I mean. Follow protocol doesn't mean that you couldn't have found another way to deal with the situation, if you know what I mean. And that's where I think the opportunities for bias sneak into the systems. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, Kurt? <clears throat> um, I have a, a couple of questions. I was wondering, um, Madam Chair, how this fits in with what, you, what you're hearing with our report coming back uh, December 1st from S338 having to do with um, racial inequity and things like that. Is that part of it or are you? I'm, I'm just not sure. And I think that's what maybe our work is to kind of vet this out a little bit and see where the S338 work uh, plays in, um, but also trying to maybe carve out something a little different. What I'm hearing here is the culture within corrections that's tied into hiring, that's tied into training. And maybe what we need to look at is the front end, which is maybe the training piece of it. And that's not where S338 is focused in on. 338 is focused in on getting the data. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at a level of how can you take those first steps to address the culture change within the context of racial justice. Okay. Uh, and I had a that makes question. Sense? Yep. A uh, uh, question for the commissioner. You've said several times that the difficulty isn't hiring, it's retaining uh, people. Is it? And I, just a, with that retaining, is that people who are coming in and they're only there a little while and they're saying, this is not for me, I'm out of here? Or is it the older ones who have been there longest and you can't keep them there? Or how does that break down? So interesting enough, I'm, you know, Representative Dowd, you asked that question because that was part of the presentation. And I'm, I'm really thinking at some point, I'd like to have... Um, the staff that worked on this hiring strategy come in and brief the Joint Justice Committee and whoever else wants to hear it. You know, it may take almost an hour to do it. I mean, I know they can shorten it down, but um, it's 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 the first, not the last. We're so so when 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 the presentation was made today, the latest numbers are we lose about 15 people a month that leave, and a big chunk of them are self-select out. They're not retiring, they're self-selecting out. I think part of the issue is, you know, you all know this, we spend $8 million a year in overtime last year, right? That's an enormous amount of overtime. And 90% and of it's forced overtime. I just had a conversation with a, with a relative of someone who works for us, who was explaining to me how this young man may move on because he can't deal with the forced overtime. You know, he works the the two to 10 shift. And then all of a sudden that, you know, uh, 10 o'clock at night, he's being told he's got to stay until two in the morning. Right. And um, 
that young professional that we're looking for, you all know this, that they have a much more balanced life than I did when I was 25 or 26, right? I would work all the overtime I could at the state police because back then we didn't get paid all the time. You would just work. And I think there's a much more balanced life. But the problem is we're so, it's, it's kind of like being on a treadmill and we keep pushing the button up to 10 and now we're at 20. We keep running. We're not going anywhere because it's this constant churn of people. So the retention's a big piece because it'll cut down on the forced overtime and um, people are getting fed up with that. Now, we don't know for sure. I'm guessing on that. But a big piece of what we're doing right now is collecting data on that. I, I'd kind of like to comment on the other piece that um, I, I would urge you to think about keeping 338 a little separate from this conversation because I would not want the issue of equity to get mixed in and kind of drowned it out in the bigger conversation of what a 338 is all about, which is eventually getting to the point of having a more robust community justice system, uh, correction system, excuse me, and focus on a conversation about equity because I think it's a big conversation. It's tough. It's hard to have. It's hard to move people. Um, people can be set in their ways. Um, so I, I just I just make that comment. I mean, it's clearly up to you how you want to proceed, but um, mm -hmm. there is a piece in 338 that I think applies to it around the way that we dealt with furlough interrupts. We have no idea if bias snuck into those decisions or not. Right. No idea. Right because we have no data one way or the other. That's why 338 is so important to start collecting the data, taking a look at it in context and so on. But the conversation about equity and how you hire and how you train, for the first time in the last class, we spent eight hours with Tabitha Moore, the president of the NAACP in Rutland, presented to the class for a whole day on, on, on equity and bias. And it was, a, as I understand, it was a fascinating conversation. And that's how you start getting people to think about how does that come into play in my role as a corrective officer. And that might be important for us. I mean, I'm putting this out to see for Thursday and possibly Friday to bring some of the folks in and talk to us that might be able to give us some direction on what language we can propose to the bills that are working through House Government Operations and House Judiciary to get the wheels going in this, get the ball rolling. Not to do the deep dive, but just to say, hey, this is the first cut at this, and this is the direction we're going to look at, um, and then do a much deeper dive come January. So we have a couple questions, Sarah and then Butch. Well, the commissioner kind of said what I was going to offer to say. The, with the keeping the data piece separate is, is important. Um, but um, but in the same report, um, I'm I'm hoping that we can hear from um, you know there was a pretty extensive RDAP report that Eitan um, gave to us and include it was about a, there were a number of different issues and one was uh, uh, the issues relating to justice reinvestment but the other one was a topic about training um, you know and I think that so I think that he, he along with some of the folks from the NAACP might be helpful. If that's what you're asking us, Madam Chair, about some folks who might be, um, you know, be able to lend their expertise around it. And I know, Commissioner, I appreciate what you're saying because early on you talked about training um, as being an important piece of this and it, that we have this opportunity with the, the legislation that's in, um, I think, would it, would it most likely, Alice, go and be part of the GovOps, the bill that's the GovOps is working with, or do we not, Do we have a sense? Oh, no, yeah, both, both committees are working. And if we start working on this, we'll have to work with Betsy Ann Rass and Bryn here. Okay. For that. You I'm excited to do this. Sorry, sorry. I just want to say, Madam Chair, thank you for, I, I think this is a, 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 a wonderful opportunity and having the commissioner's input on this is, is in support of it is, is wonderful. So thank you. You know, and we're very active in the disparity panel. Matter of fact, one of my staff was with Aton and folks today. They had a press conference um, reemphasizing, revisiting the report, talking about the next steps. Um, we're very actively involved with that, with that group. That's great. Uh, Butch, and then we'll tie this up so that we can 
uh, let Phil, we can give some direction for Phil. Poor Phil has been working a lot today, so it's time for us to finish. And he can connect with folks tomorrow and see if they're available for Thursday. So, Butch. Oh, thanks, Alice. So, Jim, this is kind of like uh, 12 steps. Sounds like a 12 step program. First of all, you have to admit that you've got a problem. And thank you both for bringing this forward because we know you do have a problem. Uh, and so it's important. We're going to we'll talk about it. We'll try to figure out something, try to get something together to kick, kick the start the game here a little bit or, or start the ball rolling or whatever you want to call it. But when you talk about training, uh, many people just go like, well, well, we'll fix it in the academy. We'll get these new recruits. We'll train them and all that. But that's, that's the real easy part. It's the continuing education for your other 1,100 or so employees, whatever it is today, mm -hmm. to bring them along with the new guys. The new guys, I, I have faith that they'll be fine. Uh, they'll, they're, they're younger, they're smarter, they're faster, they're quicker, they're all that stuff than we all are. Mm -hmm. So they'll be fine. It's, it's, it's the existing employees that will be tougher, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think back to the bill we passed of requiring uh, uh, driver or uh, state IDs when people are released. There is another provision in that bill to ask uh, PMP officers to, to train some of the we weren't even asking to train the PMP officers, but we're asking them to do a little job with the people that they were they were coming out of their uh, control. We got pushback. Yeah. We, we got a lot of pushback on that, and uh, we left it in the bill. I don't know how it's going. We've never asked, but we've got a lot of pushback on that uh, from from that group of employees. So we need to figure out a way amongst us how to make this happen. Yeah, that representative show, I think uh, just my point, I think sometimes when you get into this conversation, probably there could be some staff members listening to me talk right now and they're, they're going to say, he thinks we're racist. And that's not what this conversation is about. It's about keeping the opportunities for bias out of the system and making yourself aware of that. And you're right. I mean, the younger folks have had experience. My experience over the years now is that when you ask a, a younger person you're hiring, you know, mid twenties, you know, what's your experience around um, diversity and ethnicity and so on. And, you know, they look at you like, what are you talking about? You know, my, my roommate, my roommate was, was, uh, was black and, you know, they, they have, they've had a different experience. The problem is it's the system and people get trapped in the system. And so I think, again, um, we're not talking about, we're not talking about open, racism or open uh it's that implicit bias that is just so subtle and, you, and you're 100 right you've got to be able to admit that that may exist before you can start having the conversation and it's kind of fascinating now just in my conversations in corrections now about this issue and how people are starting to say you know um we need to face this and take a look at it to see where we are because we don't want to be someone that treats folks with disparity and, and it really and, and i think it's been uh, unfortunately proven that it's not this this conversation not all just about race i mean we have that's uh, right. sexism we have uh workplace Absolutely. harassment of anybody uh so there's a yep. it's not you, just about race and you know from the rolling days that some of the bias was around social economic status that's a that's a huge that's a huge bias that you know, some of us have had over the years that we've had to confront mm -hmm. uh, how folks that that um, sit in a social economic status that's different than ours. And I think that's a huge that's another example of what I'm talking about. It's just not about ethnicity and race. So I want to move this along because it's after 430 and we've had a long day. But Phil, you know, what I'm hearing for Thursday, maybe Friday is to start vetting this so that next week we can come up with some language um, that we could offer to the other house committees. It would have to, of course, be DOC. I don't know if it'd be the commissioner or whomever the commissioner would want to bring in. I would check with Ant Anton, Aton, I have trouble with his name, with the racial disparity panel um, there's Tabitha Moore with NAACP. 
And also there's the racial equity task force that the governor has set up. And the lead person on that is Yuanda Davis. Is that correct? Susanna Davis. Susanna, Susanna Davis, yeah. She'd be a key piece. So she would be a key. And I think we also need to bring VSEA into the conversation too, because we're dealing with staff for that. That's going to be for Thursday and Friday. You can't do all of that in one day. But I'd like to hear people's thoughts on this and suggestions on how we can do um, just the first, like, get the ball rolling. We're not going to do an in-depth uh, legislation on this, but what are some of the places, the highlights that we need to look at so that we can put in maybe intent language, or we could say we, we want to report back by the middle of January or end of January on how to best proceed to implement these X, Y, and Z, be it hiring, be it training, be it supervision, um, whatever. So, and it will allow time for committee members to vet, think this through as well. Does that make sense, Phil? Uh, yes, and if I have any questions, I know how to reach you, Alice. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kurt. Uh, that, that sounds good to me. Um, I, I'd like to talk sometime uh, Thursday or Friday about Woodside a little bit, just from what uh, Sarah and I um, what we heard from the Human Services Committee and the status of Woodside, just so we keep people appraised. And uh, a quick question. Speaking, for the... of, speaking of that, Kurt, did you see the news last night on Channel 3? No. Well, they're going to close it October 1st. Yeah, yeah it's... <laughs> well, anyway, we should talk about that. Well, the uh, legislature needs to act this September for yeah. that. So, so you can anyway, fill us in. Uh, my, another quick question for the commissioner. I, September 1st was the date for emergency rules to be submitted, having to do with good time. Do you, do you know whether those are, how that's progressing? I don't know off the top of my head, but I can get back to you. Okay, um, good. I mean, I know that, they, that, that, that the team that's working on 338 um, has been working. I wasn't briefed exactly on the rules for good time. Yeah, like okay. Thanks. So uh, Sarah, hang on, Sarah. While I think of this for Phil, it might be worth also to reach out to Bryn and Betsy, Bryn here and Betsy and mm -hmm. Rass to figure out which one uh, would want to listen in or, or zoom in. Okay. Sarah? No, I just have to hop off. I, I'm sorry, I have a... I'm That's sorry, fine, we're finishing up. Thank you. Okay, anything else from folks before we sign off here from YouTube and sign off for the day? So be thinking on this whole racial equity, um, what we've just talked about and see what we can come up with Thursday and Friday and maybe work in submitting some language next week. And we'll figure out where to submit it to and what the language says. Uh, Mary, you joined us at the last minute. Uh, we did do some work on CRF for DOC. We're okay with all the funding that's been there for the C CJCs and the equipment, domestic violence. And there is language that was within um, the CRF Act that we put in in January that does allow uh, for dollars to be moved uh, between items. And we have clarified the issue with C CJCs that DOC is going to um, connect with them and uh, clarify a little bit more of the procedures. And Matt's been doing a lot of work on this. And we feel pretty confident that uh, the CJCs and DOC will be able to work together and get the dollars out the door. Mary, did you want to say, you're on mute if you want to say anything. Thank you. Um, so you, I had a question. You said that there was in January a proposal to allow 
the transfer between, and I think you said CRF and between line items. Are you just referring June. to? Me? Okay, so June, and it's that. Did I say January? I meant June. That's okay. Just and there's so much going on that in fact maybe it did mean Janu January. <laughs> That's just the standard language that allows the transfer between. Um, Correctional services and I think out of state beds. No, 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 no. This is with the CRF funding specifically that was in, we've lost Becky, whatever the act was when we did the appropriations back in June. Mm -hmm. It does allow for those allocations to be moved, but they would have to report to Justice Oversight, Commissioner of Finance and Management, and Joint Fiscal Office. What's also now being worked on is there may be some language that Joint Fiscal Office is working on to also have a check-in on the CRF funds come October and November to see what, what um, may need to be reallocated. And are you proposing that language? No, that's that's being worked on by JFO that's going to be proposed to you guys. So just broadly, not yeah. something specific to your budgets that you're okay. responsible for. Yeah. Okay. It'll be broadly because I had a conversation with Mitzi over the weekend that we're finding that some of our dollars, we're not going to know if they're going to be able to be expended because we're dealing with vendors and actually getting equipment and they may not be able to get here in time. Yeah, I under, oh yeah, I can certainly understand that, but. Well, that's the reason for the check-in on our part. Yeah, okay. So are you proposing any changes to the budget? No. Got it, thank you. No, to the DOC budget, no. To the CRF budget, no. What about, oh, the other day, we did have that discussion about the reallocation of the three hundred and sixty thousand dollars in to reinvest it. investment. You stand by that, but yes. otherwise, yep. Okay, got it. Thank you. We agreed to all of that last week. Yep. Yep. Good. Kurt. Uh, another completely different topic. Is that? Do you want me to wait, or? I want to make sure Mary is okay with everything. Oh, I'm happy with everything in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your work. Thanks for coming down into the committee. I miss you guys. Oh, yeah, I know. I miss you too. I miss you stopping in the committee room. Yeah. Being in the committee room. Yeah, miss that too. Miss that too. Kurt. Um, I gather the contract with uh, Core Civic down in Mississippi is coming up for renewal. Is there any issues that are we might need to know about with that? Um, I mean, the issue is the issue. It's out of state beds, right? Um, so um, our contract expires at the end of the month. <clears throat> you know, we um, we have plans to bring um, somewhere between eight and twelve more folks back this month um, because they're either coming close to ending their sentence or they have to come back for programming in order to prepare to be reintegrated into the community. Um, we don't plan on sending anybody down, so the number will shrink yet again. Um, the contract, um, it would be if we were to renew it. And I, I, I mean, we're in the position where it's pretty difficult uh, to come up with another plan to deal with 200 inmates, um, would be for one year. The secretary had talked about that last week at the governor's press conference. And, um, you know, we're discussing internally right now um, additions that we need to put into that extension of the contract to include um, uh, language around protocols about COVID. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. And we know that negotiations uh, can get, um, they're not always public because there's some important information that needs to be right. negotiated. Right. Um, so we need to be a little sensitive to that when negotiations are going on. Um, anything else before we sign off here? 
If not, let's, uh, we're done for our work today and we will be back as a committee on Thursday at 8.30.